Hello and welcome back. So today I want to continue working on the LM317 high voltage power supply by actually trying out the thing, both the positive and the negative voltage versions. Now before doing that of course it's important to go over certain schematic and constructive details of how this thing was made. And of course to better understand how the circuit works make sure that you check out the first part before watching this if you haven't already seen that. So with that being said, let's begin. Now going through the comments, one of the things that was brought up was why didn't I use the TL431 as my base regulator? Now to be fair, this component comes in both the positive version, so the TL431, but it also has a negative counterpart, the TL4051. And you can build a high voltage differential regulator with these. I'll leave a link in the description to this. But the main reason why I wanted the LM317 was two features that are built into this circuit and which are not present in the TL431. And that is over current protection and over temperature protection. Both of these being important features in a good linear regulator. Now regarding the current limit, this IC comes in three main versions. So you got your LM317 and the N and the A and the HV versions with a maximum current of 1.5 amps. Then you have the M version at 500 milliamps. And finally the L and LN versions at 100 milliamps. So any of these will work for today's project, but I will be going with the L version with 100 milliamp current limit since I don't really expect to be running high currents with my high voltages. But the circuit can be built with any of these. Now the second feature we've been interested in is the over temperature protection. And you can't find too much about it in this data sheet, but in a different data sheet, so the one made by on semi, first of all we can see that the maximum junction temperature is 150 degrees Celsius. So this is a typical value for silicon semiconductors. But if we go through the data sheet and we get to the thermal shutdown feature, so this is our over temperature protection, it's set at 180 degrees Celsius, just slightly above our maximum junction temperature. So we'll have to see if the circuit actually survives going into thermal shutdown or if some smoke will come out. But more on that later. Now, to give it a fighting chance, I put the LM317 and the series field effect transistor regulator as close as possible together so that they can share the heat dissipation and have the temperature as close as possible one to the other. Also, to increase the temperature on the LM317, I also used an 18 volt Zener diode so that we have a large voltage drop on this IC so that it heats up more. And hopefully this will ensure that the thermal protection kicks in before something else goes wrong. Now regarding the rest of the schematic, what I built here is an AC input. So this is where I'll be supplying the circuit with some high voltage. Then I have a positive and a negative voltage rectifier. So it's a simple diode just to obtain the positive and negative voltages at the same time. The purpose was not to make something very, very low noise because, well, we have the filter to filter out all the noise. I'm using 4.7 microfarad capacitors all over. So we have one right after the diode, one in the capacitance multiplier, one after the capacitance multiplier, one in the adjust pin of the LM317 and one on the output. And of course, the same thing on the negative version. And I also added this double potentiometer so that we can vary the output voltage. So this will not be a fixed output voltage regulator, but a variable one. Other things to mention, the diodes that I use to protect the 317 are Schottky 2 amp 50 volt diodes. So here we don't really need high voltage diodes because the LM will never see more than 40 volts. So I use these because, well, I had them lying around. Now there's one more important feature to mention regarding the circuit. So since we're working with high voltages, all the components need to be appropriately rated. So your field effect transistor needs to be able to support high voltages, the capacitors need to be able to work with 
these voltages. But also, a component you wouldn't really expect is the resistors need to be able to handle the high voltage. So commonly, if you work with through-hole resistors, you will be using the quarter watt version. Now, if we quickly look at a datasheet for this sort of resistor, so we have here carbon film resistors, they're easily available. And if we go through the various data here, we get to our quarter watt version, and we see that we have a 200 volt maximum working voltage. But the resistor will handle 400. Now, the thing is, if you have a one ohm resistor and you apply 200 volts to it, it will disintegrate because you have 200 watts of instantaneous power dissipation. So that will not survive. Now, if you have a 200 kilo ohm resistor and you apply 200 volts to it, then you don't really have a problem because the power dissipation will be much, much smaller. But by applying high voltages, the resistor value will no longer be constant. So if you exceed the maximum working voltage, the value will start to decrease and the resistor will not behave as it's supposed to. So this is just one thing to keep in mind if you work with high voltage circuits. Now moving on, let's test out the circuit. And first thing to see is if the circuit actually works. And for that, I prepared this quite extensive setup, but don't worry, I'll walk you through it. So what I have here is the circuit itself, and at the moment it's wired so that an AC can be supplied directly into it from my isolation transformer. I've got my first multimeter showing us just what AC voltage we're applying. And then there's two multimeters to measure the positive and the negative voltage output. So if we connect the power, we can see that I'm supplying it with around 230 volts AC. And now we have the two outputs, one at 131 and the other at 137. So first thing to try out is the variable output voltage. So if I start to turn the potentiometer, we can see that both output voltages are varying. And with the values that I used, we can go from the 130 to around 230 volts. Now, of course, the exact values can be adjusted with the resistors and the potentiometer value. Now, one thing I would like to point out is that the output voltage seems to vary. It doesn't seem to be very stable. But this is not really a problem of the circuit as it is of the multimeters. So just to show that, I brought out this other multimeter that I have, which is slightly better than these ones. And if we measure the output voltage, let's see the negative voltage first. We can see that we have 174.7 exactly. It's not varying. And if we look at the positive voltage output, we see 172.1 exactly. So one of the drawbacks of using cheap multimeters is that they're not very precise. I mean, you will see this in their data sheet and they clearly specify that they have one or two percent tolerance plus a few digits, depending on what multimeter you have. So this is perfectly normal, but this is not real. So the supply is actually stable on its output. Next, to see just how well the supply is working, how the stages in the supply are working, let's look at each individual voltage throughout the stages. So right after the first diode, we have 314 volts, so the 230 AC rectified. Then after the first transistor, so after the capacitance multiplier, we only have 185 left. And finally on the output, we get down to 170. So the voltage drop appearing on the LM317 is only 14 volts. So our field effect transistor is doing its job of keeping the large voltage drop on it rather than on the LM. So the circuit is working in its safe operating area. Now, next thing to see is just how noisy the circuit is. So for that, I have my oscilloscope brought out and by using a low noise connection, so very short leads, we can look into the circuit's output first of all. So we need a completely different voltage base much, much smaller voltages. So at 10 millivolts per division, we do see some spikes here and there, but most of this is probably coming from the equipment on the table rather than the circuit itself. Now, on the other hand, if we check what's before the LM, so see how noise evolves through the circuit. So this is the voltage after the capacitance multiplier. 
and we can already see that there is some noise in here and we see the 50 Hz being rectified. So it's just about 20 millivolts of noise, but it's something and the LM is doing its job at filtering this. And now if we change the voltage base a bit, so to see what's at the beginning of the circuit, we can see that we have multiple volts of noise after the first diode. So we can see that noise is appearing at the beginning of the circuit, but the supply is doing its job at filtering it out. Next, we can look at just how stable the output voltage is when the load varies. And for that, I connected the circuit now to the DC output of my variable high voltage supply. And on the negative voltage output, we don't have anything because only the positive voltage diode is conducting. So right now it's set to 128 volts. And I have my output here, which I'll be connecting to my active load. But before that, we can already see that the circuit by itself is using about 2 milliamps. So this is the quiescent current of the circuit. At the same time, it's set to this high value because of the two output resistors in the LM, the resistors that are needed to set the output voltage. And this is also roughly the minimum current that the LM needs to function correctly. So this could have been made lower, but the LM won't really accept that. So now if I connect my active load, so now I added 9 milliamps, we see that the current went up by 9 point something, so the two meters are as precise as they are. But now if we focus on the output voltage and we start to increase the current, we see that the output voltage increases for whatever reason. So we're at around 90 milliamps, which is quite a lot for this regulator, but we still have roughly the same voltage that we started off with. So it did increase a bit, but that can be down to the way in which the feedback resistors are placed. Now if we increase a bit more, at some point the overcurrent protection kicks in and the output voltage just drops. Now the next thing to see is just what are the voltage drops on the circuit. So what is the minimum voltage drop with which the circuit will actually work? So what I did here, I put my old multimeter back so we can make our measurements with the better one. And I left the nine milliamp load. And now I will decrease the input voltage up until the point in which my output voltage starts to vary. So we can see now at around 141 volts, the output started to vary. So let's just slowly increase it. And this is about the point at which the output stabilizes. So now let's see what are the voltage drops on the circuit. So first of all, let's have a precise measurement of the output. We have 128.5. Before the LM circuit, we have 132.4. And right at the beginning after the first diode, we have 137. So these voltages are caused by, on one side, the minimum voltage needed for the LM to function correctly, which is about 2 free volts. And for our capacitance multiplier, we have the voltage needed to drive the transistor, so the gate source threshold voltage, but also the voltage drop on the resistor between the gate and the drain, through which a certain current is passing and which is also causing a certain voltage drop. So the circuit seems to be working quite nicely, there's just one more feature left to test out, and that is the over temperature protection. I'm gonna go get my fire extinguisher for that. So now we're ready. There we go. So for this experiment, I set my third multimeter in the temperature measurement mode, and I have a thermocouple connected very close to the LM317 and touching the radiator. So into the thermal paste with which the LM317 is connected to the radiator to the power transistor. So let's fire this up. Again, I'm using the DC voltage, so I'm not really bothering with the AC because we're testing only one of the regulators. And to heat the circuit up, I'm going to be setting slightly higher supply voltage so that we have a voltage drop on the circuit. So this should do. And we can add a bit of load now. So the point is not to drive the regulator into overcurrent protection, but into over temperature protection. So we will need to be below the 100 milliamp threshold. 
So let's say 80 milliamps, output voltage stable at around 128, and we can see the temperature slowly rising. So according to the data sheet, over temperature protection kicks in at around 180 degrees Celsius. So we'll see what happens first, over temperature protection or smoke. This is gonna take a while. So we see something is going on. Let's just reduce the, so something did happen. Not sure if the power supply had a problem or the regulator. So I fixed my power supply in the meantime, the problem was coming from this and took the oscilloscope channels to measure the input and output voltage. So with blue we can see the input voltage, there's a bit of a stability issue with it so that's down to my power supply really. But with the output voltage in yellow, we can see the thermal protection in action. So output voltage drops down to zero, stays there for a while, and then the output slowly recovers. So basically the thermal protection is working correctly. So the circuit seems to work. It has quite a stable output voltage with not a lot of noise. You can make it handle more power dissipation if you add the proper heatsink to it. It can be built both in a positive voltage version and a negative voltage version. You can build it with a fixed output voltage or a variable output voltage. It will also survive an over temperature event. But regarding the over current event, well, at the moment, the way I built it, it doesn't survive. So I did test it out off camera without a current limit from my benchtop supply. And well, the circuit broke. Now, nothing interesting happened, like smoke or sparks or anything, it just flat out broke. And looking at why that happened and how to handle this problem is a bit of a longer story. So I will be covering that in part two of this part two. So in part two B. But for now, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos and see you next time. Bye bye.